Chapter Two. In the year 1813, at the age of sixty-nine or thereabouts, Father Goriot had sold his business and retired to Madame Vauquer's boarding house. When he first came there, he had taken the rooms now occupied by Madame Couture. He had paid twelve hundred francs a year, like a man to whom five louis more or less was a mere trifle. For him, Madame Vauquer had made various improvements in the three rooms destined for his use, in consideration of a certain sum paid in advance, so it was said, for the miserable furniture, that is to say, for some yellow cotton curtains, a few chairs of stained wood covered with Utrecht velvet, several wretched colored prints in frames, and wallpapers that a little suburban tavern would have disdained. Possibly it was the careless generosity with which Father Goriot allowed himself to be overreached at this period of his life. They called him Monsieur Goriot very respectfully then, that gave Madame Vauquer the meanest opinion of his business abilities. She looked on him as an imbecile where money was concerned. Goriot had brought with him a considerable wardrobe the gorgeous outfit of a retired tradesman who denies himself nothing. Madame Vauquer's astonished eyes beheld no less than eighteen cambric-fronted shirts, the splendor of their fineness being enhanced by a pair of pins, each bearing a large diamond and connected by a short chain, an ornament which adorned the vermicelli maker's shirt-front. He usually wore a coat of cornflower blue, his rotund and portly person was still further set off by a clean white waistcoat and a gold chain and seals which dangled over that broad expanse. When his hostess accused him of being a bit of a beau, he smiled with the vanity of a citizen whose foible is gratified. His cupboards, ormoirs as he called them in the popular dialect, were filled with a quantity of plate that he brought with him. The widow's eyes gleamed as she obligingly helped him to unpack the soup ladles, tablespoons, forks, cruet stands, tureens, dishes, and breakfast services, all of silver, which were duly arranged upon shelves, besides a few more or less handsome pieces of plate, all weighing no inconsiderable number of ounces. He could not bring himself to part with these gifts that reminded him of past domestic festivals. This was my wife's present to me on the first anniversary of our wedding day, he said to Madame Vauquer, as he put away a little silver posset dish with two turtle doves spilling on the cover. Poor dear, she spent on it all the money she had saved before we were married. Do you know, I would sooner scratch the earth with my nails for a living, madame, than part with that. But I shall be able to take my coffee out of it every morning for the rest of my days, thank the Lord. I am not to be pitied. There's not much fear of my starving for some time to come. Finally, Madame Vauquer's magpie's eye had discovered and read certain entries in the list of shareholders in the funds, and after a rough calculation, was disposed to credit Goriot, worthy man, with something like ten thousand francs a year. From that day forward, Madame Vauquer, née de Conflans, who as a matter of fact had seen forty-eight summers, though she would only own to thirty-nine of them, Madame Vauquer had her own ideas. Though Goriot's eyes seemed to have shrunk in their sockets, though they were weak and watery, owing to some glandular affection which compelled him to wipe them continually, she considered him to be a very gentlemanly and pleasant-looking man. Moreover, the widow saw favorable indications of character in the well-developed calves of his legs and in his square-shaped nose, indications still further borne out by the worthy man's full-moon countenance and look of stupid good-nature. This, in all probability, was a strongly built animal, whose brains mostly consisted in a capacity for affection. His hair, worn in eye de pigeon and duly powdered every morning by the barber from the Ecole Polytechnique, described five points on his low forehead and made an elegant setting to his face. Though his manners were somewhat boorish, he was always as neat as a new pin, and he took his snuff in a lordly way, 
like a man who knows that his snuff-box is always likely to be filled with Macaboy, so that when Madame Vauquer lay down to rest on the day of M. Goriot's installation, her heart, like a larded partridge, sweltered before the fire of a burning desire to shake off the shroud of Vauquer and rise again as Goriot she would marry again sell her boarding-house give her hand to this fine flower of citizenship become a lady of consequence in the quarter and ask for subscriptions for charitable purposes she would make little sunday excursions to choisy soisy gentilly she would have a box at the theatre when she liked instead of waiting for the author's tickets that one of her boarders sometimes gave her in july the whole Eldorado of a little Parisian household rose up before Madame Vauquer in her dreams. Nobody knew that she herself possessed forty thousand francs, accumulated sou by sou. That was her secret. Surely, as far as money was concerned, she was a very tolerable match. And in other respects, I am quite his equal, she said to herself turning as if to assure herself of the charms of a form that the portly sylvie found moulded in down feathers every morning for three months from that day madame veuve vauquer availed herself of the services of m goriot's coiffeur and went to some expense over her toilette expense justifiable on the ground that she owed it to herself and her establishment to pay some attention to appearances when such highly respectable persons honoured her house with their presence she expended no small amount of ingenuity in a sort of weeding process of her lodgers announcing her intention of receiving henceforward none but people who were in every way select if a stranger presented himself she let him know that m goriot one of the best known and most highly respected merchants in paris had singled out her boarding-house for a residence she drew up a prospectus headed maison vauquer in which it was asserted that hers was one of the oldest and most highly recommended boarding-houses in the latin quarter from the windows of the house thus ran the prospectus there is a charming view of the valet des gobelins so there is from the third floor and a beautiful garden extending down to an avenue of lindens at the further end mention was made of the bracing air of the place and its quiet situation it was this prospectus that attracted madame la comtesse de lambert mesnil a widow of six-and-thirty who was awaiting the final settlement of her husband's affairs and of another matter regarding a pension due to her as the wife of a general who had died on the field of battle on this madame vauquer saw to her table lighted a fire daily in the sitting-room for nearly six months and kept the promise of her prospectus even going to some expense to do so and the countess on her side addressed madame vauquer as my dear and promised her two more boarders the baronne de vaumerlon and the widow of a colonel the late comte de piquoisy who were about to leave a boarding-house in the marais where the terms were higher than at the maison vauquer both these ladies moreover would be very well to do when the people at the war office had come to an end of their formalities but government departments are always so dilatory the lady added after dinner the two widows went up together to madame vauquer's room and had a snug little chat over some cordial and various delicacies reserved for the mistress of the house madame vauquer's ideas as to goriot were cordially approved by madame de lambert mesnil it was a capital notion which for that matter she had guessed from the very first in her opinion the vermicelli maker was an excellent man ah my dear lady such a well-preserved man of his age as sound as my eyesight a man who might make a woman happy said the widow the good-natured countess turned to the subject of madame vauquer's dress which was not in harmony with her projects you must put yourself on a war footing said she after much serious consideration the two widows went shopping together 
they purchased a hat adorned with ostrich feathers and a cap at the palais royal and the countess took her friend to the magasin de la petite jeannette where they chose a dress and a scarf thus equipped for the campaign the widow looked exactly like the prize animal hung out for a sign above an a la mode beef shop but she herself was so much pleased with the improvement as she considered it in her appearance that she felt that she lay under some obligation to the countess and though by no means open-handed she begged that lady to accept a hat that cost twenty francs the fact was that she needed the countess's services on the delicate mission of sounding goriot the countess must sing her praises in his ears madame de lambermesnil lent herself very good-naturedly to this manoeuvre began her operations and succeeded in obtaining a private interview but the overtures that she made with a view to securing him for herself were received with embarrassment not to say a repulse she left him revolted by his coarseness my angel said she to her dear friend you will make nothing of that man yonder he is absurdly suspicious and he is a mean curmudgeon an idiot a fool you would never be happy with him after what had passed between m goriot and madame de lambermesnil the countess would no longer live under the same roof she left the next day forgot to pay for six months board and left behind her wardrobe cast-off clothing to the value of five francs eagerly and persistently as madame vauquer sought her quondam lodger the comtesse de lambermesnil was never heard of again in paris the widow often talked of this deplorable business and regretted her own too confiding disposition as a matter of fact she was as suspicious as a cat but she was like many other people who cannot trust their own kin and put themselves at the mercy of the next chance comer an odd but common phenomenon whose causes may readily be traced to the depths of the human heart perhaps there are people who know that they have nothing more to look for from those with whom they live they have shown the emptiness of their hearts to their housemates and in their secret selves they are conscious that they are severely judged and that they deserve to be judged severely but still they feel an unconquerable craving for praises that they do not hear or they are consumed by a desire to appear to possess in the eyes of a new audience the qualities which they have not hoping to win the admiration or affection of strangers at the risk of forfeiting it again some day or once more there are other mercenary natures who never do a kindness to a friend or a relation simply because these have a claim upon them while a service done to a stranger brings its reward to self-love such natures feel but little affection for those who are nearest to them they keep their kindness for remoter circles of acquaintance and show most to those who dwell on its utmost limits madame vauquer belonged to both these essentially mean false and execrable classes if i had been there at the time vautrin would say at the end of the story i would have shown her up and that misfortune would not have befallen you i know that kind of fizz like all narrow natures madame vauquer was wont to confine her attention to events and did not go very deeply into the causes that brought them about she likewise preferred to throw the blame of her own mistakes on other people so she chose to consider that the honest vermicelli maker was responsible for her misfortune it had opened her eyes so she said with regard to him as soon as she saw that her blandishments were in vain and that her outlay on her toilette was money thrown away she was not slow to discover the reason of his indifference it became plain to her at once that there was some other attraction to use her own expression in short it was evident that the hope she had so fondly cherished was a baseless delusion and that she would never make anything out of that man yonder in the countess's forcible phrase the countess seemed to have been a judge of character 
Madame Vauquer's aversion was naturally more energetic than her friendship, for her hatred was not in proportion to her love, but to her disappointed expectations. The human heart may find here and there a resting place short of the highest height of affection, but we seldom stop in the steep downward slope of hatred. Still, M. Goriot was a lodger, and the widow's wounded self-love could not vent itself in an explosion of wrath. Like a monk harassed by the prior of his convent, she was forced to stifle her sighs of disappointment and to gulp down her craving for revenge. Little minds find gratification for their feelings, benevolent or otherwise, by a constant exercise of petty ingenuity. The widow employed her woman's malice to devise a system of covert persecution. She began by a course of retrenchment. Various luxuries, which had found their way to the table, appeared there no more. "'No more gherkins, no more anchovies. They have made a fool of me,' she said to Sylvie one morning, and they returned to the old bill of fare. The thrifty frugality, necessary to those who mean to make their way in the world, had become an inveterate habit of life with M. Goriot. Soup, boiled beef, and a dish of vegetables had been and always would be the dinner he liked best, so Madame Vauquer found it very difficult to annoy a boarder whose tastes were so simple. He was proof against her malice, and in desperation she spoke to him and of him slightingly before the other lodgers, who began to amuse themselves at his expense, and so gratified her desire for revenge. Towards the end of the first year the widow's suspicions had reached such a pitch that she began to wonder how it was that a retired merchant with a secure income of seven or eight thousand livres, the owner of such magnificent plate and jewellery handsome enough for a kept mistress, should be living in her house. Why should he devote so small a proportion of his money to his expenses? Until the first year was nearly at an end, Goriot had dined out once or twice every week, but these occasions came less frequently, and at last he was scarcely absent from the dinner-table twice a month. It was hardly expected that Madame Vauquer should regard the increased regularity of her boarder's habits with complacency when those little excursions of his had been so much to her interest. She attributed the change not so much to a gradual diminution of fortune as to a spiteful wish to annoy his hostess. It is one of the most detestable habits of a Lilliputian mind to credit other people with its own malignant pettiness. Unluckily, towards the end of the second year, M. Goriot's conduct gave some color to the idle talk about him. He asked Madame Vauquer to give him a room on the second floor, and to make a corresponding reduction in her charges. Apparently such strict economy was called for that he did without a fire all through the winter. Madame Vauquer asked to be paid in advance, an arrangement to which M. Goriot consented, and thenceforward she spoke of him as Father Goriot. What had brought about this decline and fall? Conjecture was keen, but investigation was difficult. Father Goriot was not communicative. In the sham countess's phrase, he was a curmudgeon. Empty-headed people who babble about their own affairs because they have nothing else to occupy them naturally conclude that if people say nothing of their doings, it is because their doings will not bear being talked about. So the highly respectable merchant became a scoundrel, and the late beau was an old rogue. Opinion fluctuated. Sometimes, according to Vautrin, who came about this time to live in the Maison Vauquer, Father Goriot was a man who went on change and dabbled, to use the sufficiently expressive language of the stock exchange, in stocks and shares after he had ruined himself by heavy speculation. Sometimes it was held that he was one of those petty gamblers who nightly play for small stakes until they win a few francs. 
a theory that he was a detective in the employ of the home office found favor at one time but vautrin urged that goriot was not sharp enough for one of that sort there were yet other solutions father goriot was a skinflint a shark of a money-lender a man who lived by selling lottery tickets he was by turns all the most mysterious brood of vice and shame and misery yet however vile his life might be the feeling of repulsion which he aroused in others was not so strong that he must be banished from their society he paid his way besides goriot had his uses everyone vented his spleen or sharpened his wit on him he was pelted with jokes and belabored with hard words the general consensus of opinion was in favor of a theory which seemed the most likely this was madame vauquer's view according to her the man so well preserved at his time of life as sound as her eyesight with whom a woman might be very happy was a libertine who had strange tastes these are the facts upon which madame vauquer's slanders were based early one morning some few months after the departure of the unlucky countess who had managed to live for six months at the widow's expense madame vauquer not yet dressed heard the rustle of a silk dress and a young woman's light footstep on the stair some one was going to goriot's room he seemed to expect the visit for his door stood ajar the portly sylvie presently came up to tell her mistress that a girl too pretty to be honest dressed like a goddess and not a speck of mud on her laced cashmere boots had glided in from the street like a snake had found the kitchen and asked for monsieur goriot's room madame vauquer and the cook listening overheard several words affectionately spoken during the visit which lasted for some time when m goriot went downstairs with the lady the stout sylvie forthwith took her basket and followed the lover-like couple under pretext of going to do her marketing m goriot must be awfully rich all the same madame she reported on her return to keep her in such style just imagine it there was a splendid carriage waiting at the corner of the place de l'estrapade and she got into it while they were at dinner that evening madame vauquer went to the window and drew the curtain as the sun was shining into goriot's eyes you are beloved of fair ladies monsieur goriot the sun seeks you out she said alluding to his visitor peste you have good taste she was very pretty that was my daughter he said with a kind of pride in his voice and the rest chose to consider this as the fatuity of an old man who wishes to save appearances a month after this visit m goriot received another the same daughter who had come to see him that morning came again after dinner this time in evening dress the boarders in deep discussion in the dining-room caught a glimpse of a lovely fair-haired woman slender graceful and much too distinguished looking to be a daughter of father goriot's two of them cried the portly sylvie who did not recognize the lady of the first visit a few days later and another young lady a tall well-moulded brunette with dark hair and bright eyes came to ask for m goriot three of them said sylvie then the second daughter who had first come in the morning to see her father came shortly afterwards in the evening she wore a ball dress and came in a carriage four of them commented madame vauquer and her plump handmaid sylvie saw not a trace of resemblance between this great lady and the girl in her simple morning dress who had entered her kitchen on the occasion of her first visit at that time goriot was paying twelve hundred francs a year to his landlady and madame vauquer saw nothing out of the common in the fact that a rich man had four or five mistresses nay she thought it very knowing of him to pass them off as his daughters 
she was not at all inclined to draw a hard and fast line or to take umbrage at his sending for them to the maison vauquaire yet inasmuch as these visits explained her boarder's indifference to her she went so far at the end of the second year as to speak of him as an ugly old wretch when at length her boarder declined to nine hundred francs a year she asked him very insolently what he took her house to be after meeting one of these ladies on the stairs father goriot answered that the lady was his eldest daughter so you have two or three dozen daughters have you said madame vauquer sharply i have only two her boarder answered meekly like a ruined man who is broken in to all the cruel usage of misfortune towards the end of the third year father goriot reduced his expenses still further he went up to the third story and now paid forty-five francs a month he did without snuff told his hairdresser that he no longer required his services and gave up wearing powder when goriot appeared for the first time in this condition an exclamation of astonishment broke from his hostess at the color of his hair a dingy olive gray he had grown sadder day by day under the influence of some hidden trouble among all the faces round the table his was the most woebegone there was no longer any doubt goriot was an elderly libertine whose eyes had only been preserved by the skill of the physician from the malign influence of the remedies necessitated by the state of his health the disgusting color of his hair was a result of his excesses and of the drugs which he had taken that he might continue his career the poor old man's mental and physical condition afforded some grounds for the absurd rubbish talked about him when his outfit was worn out he replaced the fine linen by calico at fourteen sous the l his diamonds his gold snuff-box watch-chain and trinkets disappeared one by one he had left off wearing the cornflower blue coat and was sumptuously arrayed summer as well as winter in a coarse chestnut-brown coat a plush waistcoat and doe-skin breeches he grew thinner and thinner his legs were shrunken his cheeks once so puffed out by contented bourgeois prosperity were covered with wrinkles and the outlines of the jawbones were distinctly visible there were deep furrows in his forehead in the fourth year of his residence in the rue neuve sainte geneviève he was no longer like his former self the hale vermicelli manufacturer sixty-two years of age who had looked scarce forty the stout comfortable prosperous tradesman with an almost bucolic air and such a brisk demeanour that it did you good to look at him the man with something boyish in his smile had suddenly sunk into his dotage and had become a feeble vacillating septuagenarian the keen bright blue eyes had grown dull and faded to a steel-gray color the red inflamed rims looked as though they had shed tears of blood he excited feelings of repulsion in some and of pity in others the young medical students who came to the house noticed the drooping of his lower lip and the conformation of the facial angle and after teasing him for some time to no purpose they declared that cretinism was setting in one evening after dinner madame vauquer said half banteringly to him so those daughters of yours don't come to see you any more eh? meaning to imply her doubts as to his paternity but father goriot shrank as if his hostess had touched him with a sword-point they come sometimes he said in a tremulous voice aha you still see them sometimes cried the students bravo father goriot the old man scarcely seemed to hear the witticisms at his expense that followed on the words he had relapsed into the dreamy state of mind that these superficial observers took for senile torpor due to his lack of intelligence if they had only known they might have been deeply interested by the problem of his condition but few problems were more obscure 
It was easy, of course, to find out whether Gorio had really been a vermicelli manufacturer. The amount of his fortune was readily discoverable. But the old people, who were most inquisitive as to his concerns, never went beyond the limits of the quarter, and lived in the lodging-house much as oysters cling to a rock. As for the rest, the current of life in Paris daily awaited them, and swept them away with it. So soon as they left the Rue Neuve Saint Geneviève, they forgot the existence of the old man, their butt at dinner. For those narrow souls, or for careless youth, the misery in Father Goriot's withered face and its dull apathy were quite incompatible with wealth or any sort of intelligence. As for the creatures whom he called his daughters, all Madame Vauquer's boarders were of her opinion. With the faculty for severe logic sedulously cultivated by elderly women during long evenings of gossip, till they can always find an hypothesis to fit all circumstances, she was wont to reason thus. If Father Gorio had daughters of his own, as rich as those ladies who came here seemed to be, he would not be lodging in my house on the third floor at forty-five francs a month, and he would not go about dressed like a poor man. No objection could be raised to these inferences. So, by the end of the month of November, 1819, at the time when the curtain rises on this drama, everyone in the house had come to have a very decided opinion as to the poor old man. He had never had either wife or daughter, excesses had reduced him to this sluggish condition he was a sort of human mollusk who should be classed among the capulidae so said one of the dinner contingent an employee at the museum who had a pretty wit of his own poiret was an eagle a gentleman compared with goriot poiret would join the talk argue answer when he was spoken to as a matter of fact his talk arguments and responses contributed nothing to the conversation for poiret had a habit of repeating what the others said in different words still he did join in the talk he was alive and seemed capable of feeling while father goriot to quote the museum official again was invariably at zero degrees real mur End of chapter 2